you lot. You spend all your time thinking about dying. Like you're gonna get killed by eggs or beef or global warming or asteroids. But you never take time to imagine the impossible. And maybe you survive. Hello and welcome back to another Thoughts Per Episode Doctor Who edition. Today we are talking about the second episode of the show, The End of the World, because RTD is just extra like that and thought he'd talk about blowing up the Earth on the second episode of the series, and the mad lad made it work. He made it fit damn near perfectly. Because while this episode is about the end of the Earth, it's also about the end of Gallifrey and helping Rose and the audience understand what the Doctor lost by relating it back to Rose and back to us and back to our planet and our world and showing us the tragedy of time and entropy and change. And change is something we're going to be talking a lot about in this show because I think the journey of the Doctor from the beginning of the Ninth Doctor to the end of the Eleventh is about change and your approach to it and how you feel about change. The paper's slightly psychic, shows them whatever I want them to see. Saves a lot of time. He's blue. Yeah. This episode is also about throwing Rose into the thick of it in terms of culture shock. The Doctor's like, you wanna see some aliens? Here's some aliens. It also feels like a bit of a flex in terms of production. It's like they're saying, we're New Who now, we've got a slightly bigger budget than the old Doctor Who, we've got better technology than the old Doctor Who, look at all the aliens we can make. Now, apparently the year is 5.5-apple-26, which is an interesting categorization for, for time. I guess when you get to the year 5.5 billion, you're going to want some easier, more direct ways of approaching, like, an easy-to-read date, but... Also, this is just kind of played for laughs, and this is a problem I have with Doctor Who as a science fiction franchise, is that it doesn't really care about its own chronology. And that might sound <laughs> stupid, because this is a time travel show, and we later learn that time can be rewritten, but I would love some kind of basic, like, it's always a new timeline and a new idea, and I'm sure if I looked hard enough, I would easily find overlapping ideas about like they mentioned that the year 12,005 is the new Roman Empire I'm sure something else around then like maybe not overlapping but unlikely like I think at some point they mentioned that the human race almost goes extinct within the next 100 years or 20 or 30 years but then that's also at odds with something else that happens around that time you know what I mean but that's not what this show is about and I've semi made my peace with that over the years but you know I do still wish like almost Star Trek that it would have like a set history and that they might revisit certain periods and they do to be fair at the start of this you go to New Earth twice um, but that's like one of the only times that happens and so what happens is as you go through the show you learn to just kind of like stop caring about these expository details about where you are and like what funky year it is and what funky societal you know structure there is because it's never gonna matter ever again you just take what you need for the particular episode and you keep that in your brain like you know how rtd era who has the doctor shouting about the shadow proclamation all the time they do kind of go into it towards the very end of david tennant's era but really it's just it's just sci-fi babble for sci-fi babble's sake, and I'm not a big fan of that. Moisturize me, moisturize me. Cassandra feels like a direct retaliation to what was, I think, a little bit more front and centre in the early 2000s, which, in Britain at least, which was this age of cosmetic appeal and plastic surgery and obsession with looking like as good as possible and don't get me wrong that's still absolutely prevalent and, and, and in every facet of society but I feel like compared to the early 2000s it's been toned down at least a smidgen but there was also something else I've noticed about Cassandra in this episode that's where I used to live when I was a little boy down there a little bit of background about me I'm bi and I didn't realize I was bi until I was 25 so I do not have this history of having 
this queer perspective on the world. It's only really in the last few years as I've realised who I am and embraced my own bisexuality that I've really started looking for more queer portrayal in fiction. And so as people preemptively get up in arms about Shuji Gatwa's era, you know, the people I mean, the ones that aren't really worth discussing, the, the phobics, I find it really funny that straight up in episode two we have a trans character. And I think this gets explored more in season two in terms of Cassandra, uh, but I don't really remember it because it didn't really stick out in my brain. But, you know, she's not exactly the fucking role model what, <laughs> for trans people here. Yeah. She's not exactly a nice person. But I do find it interesting how RTD2, uh, that era that's coming up, is going to be way more openly queer if the cast of actors is anything to go by, which is something to be celebrated if that was not clear. I find it interesting that clearly, you know, it's almost like he wanted to do more earlier in the show and it's just, you know, it's just a little common, it's just a little thing because that's what all they could really get away with back then. And I feel like there are going to be people who roll their eyes at that statement, but you got to realise, like, I went to uni for creative writing, like, oh god, about 10 years ago now, and I was told by visiting writers at the time that if they ever wanted to write gay characters, they had to be gay for a reason. So I can only imagine, like, the extra limitations on transgender characters. There would be a lot of hubbub about, like, oh, does it serve narrative? Like, basically a lot of excuses to not include queer characters in fiction. It was a real thing. And I'm sure still is. I have absolutely no fucking experience with publishing and, and trying to get stories published. But I'm sure it's better now, based on what we see on telly. But, um, yeah... For those of you who are new to this kind of Thoughts Per Episode podcast series and don't know me, I'm bi. I'm going to be talking about this series from a queer perspective sometimes, uh, and that's just going to be the way that it is. Because, honestly, like, I understand. I feel like, having not known I was bi for so long, it's almost like I have access to the memories of a straight person in terms of regarding media. But I understand not thinking about this stuff when you watch media. But in the years before I realised I was bi, like, leading up to the realisation, I guess, I was very much like, why am I so happy whenever I see queer characters on screen? Why does it make me happy to see that? And it does. And I'm a fan of old media, you know, I've been watching old Star Trek, so I've been reading old Wheel of Time books. I watched old classic Doctor Who episodes, and you subconsciously look for it. Like, it's just something, it's like a need. It's like, it's like you want to see yourself... Uh, like portrayed within the story and obviously I'm not trans but um just like if we're if we're celebrating any queer representation it was just nice to be like oh there's a mention of a trans character in episode two and my nine-year-old ass didn't notice it and whenever I watched it when I was 16 I didn't fucking notice it and whenever I watched it when I was like 23 I didn't fucking notice it but fourth time's a charm I guess anyway sorry I hope that made sense I know I took a little bit of time talking about that but it's important to me my name's Rose that's a sort of plant we might be related talking to a twig one of the things I love about re-watching this show is you only tend to remember the most dramatic moments the most important moments and you forget just these fun little like throwaway 30 second scenes specifically in terms of a ninth doctor I always remember him as being very grumpy because obviously he's the the post grief doctor he's the po well, not post grief he's the middle of grief doctor he's the post war doctor he's the most damaged doctor and we'll talk about that again in just a second but something I forget is that he's still the doctor like in this episode all over the place at the first half at least he is smiling and grinning and just delighted to be a part of events and observing events and introducing Rose to this side of reality I always think of Nine as grumpy but damn it the doctor dances it's also really interesting to see him this happy because it's almost like he's getting back into the swing of things he's like letting himself enjoy adventuring again after everything that's happened who are you then doctor what are you called what sort of alien are you i'm just the doctor from what planet <laughs> well it's not as if you know what it is where are you from what does it matter tell me who you are this is who i am right here right now all right all that counts is here and now and this is me 
I love how angry and defensive he gets when Rose puts him in a corner and demands to know who he is and where he comes from because the pain is still too raw and he is not ready to talk about it yet and he is not ready to even discuss the fact that it is painful or why it is painful but I think it's great because at the start of this episode the doctor doesn't say right we're gonna go to VF5 billion I've got something I want you to see it's just like a whimsical oh let's let's go into the far far future see what it's like over there but like you can tell somewhere in his subconscious he is doing this on purpose because he wants Rose to understand and by the end of the episode we have that lovely conversation where she does understand and that's when he finds finally feels safe in revealing to her that, like, his home planet is gone just like the Earth was gone in the future. The end of the Earth... is gone. We're too busy saving ourselves, no one saw it go. All those years, all that history, no one was even looking. I mean, there's trauma dumping and then there's forcing your friend to go through a sliver of what you went through uh, to, to, to really be able to relate to who you are. And that's kind of a kind of fucked up. But, you know, it happened. Here we are. No, but the Ninth Doctor is very much a man of hard truths. And I think this is a hard truth he wanted to expose Rose to. I know where you're from. Forgive me for intruding, but it's remarkable that you even exist. I just want to say. How sorry I am. At this point of the show, we are also being introduced to who the Doctor is and why he's a tragic figure. And I think, again, not to drive this point home too much, but this episode is just so fucking fantastic as an introduction to the Doctor and, and who he is. And, you know, it's the first time we hear the word Time Lord. But, like, again, for older viewers, it's like recontextualizing the fact that he's a Time Lord is something special and rare and weird. So, once again, older viewers and newer viewers are actually on the same page as to, like, not understanding the context with which we're being introduced to the Doctor. Also, something to point out, because I guess I'm trying to drive away all potential potential fans of Doctor Who, I want to talk about the Timeless Child stuff. Obviously, the Timeless Child is a huge retcon that is not something that has been considered, for the most part, throughout the run of a show. You know, you've got some hints during the Seventh Doctor's era, apparently, that there's something different about him as a Time Lord. Um, just in general, I know there's a few hints that he's more than, quote-unquote, more than just a Time Lord. But when, if we are to approach this episode as like something that exists within the canon and the timeless child is something that has quote-unquote always been a part of a canon even though it hasn't it's very interesting that um it's a tree lady called jade i think she's called jade it is very interesting that jade scanner had such trouble identifying the doctor's species and of course that is just because they're trying to build up to the reveal that he's a time lord and there's going to be moments later on in the series where some scanner is going to identify him as a time lord but i just find it fun to like consider in the head canon of like if if the doctor isn't a time lord and is this extra dimensional being sorry if you didn't watch the jodie whittaker era shit got wild it's fun that this like super high tech advanced five billion years in the future scanner would have trouble identifying him have pity Everything has its time and everything dies. Rose is unable to stop the Doctor from letting Cassandra die, and that's super interesting because Rose here has a stronger moral complex than the Doctor. And the Doctor's morality over the course of the series is something that changes, is flexible, is on a whim. I was reminded of dinosaurs on a spaceship the other day, and he straight up kills a dude in that episode. But certainly in the RTD era, we're, we're given a Doctor who goes from being a, a man of hard truths and a man of consequences from, like, post-Time War to a man who is a little bit more adjusted to, uh, you know, being a moral human being and, and not just executing his enemies. Of course, the Cassandra death isn't really a death. Um, I don't know if we want to call that a retcon or not. We meet her again next season, but still, it's very much presented as a death in this episode, and I think we should treat it as such. Last episode, I talked about the juxtaposition of the terrestrial and the extraterrestrial, and I think it's really fun that the Earth gets played out by Britney Spears here. Like, clearly... We are in an alien future where humans as we know them do not typically exist anymore. 
Uh, but the earth still gets played out by a song that we recognize that links us back to this idea of all of reality, terrestrial and extraterrestrial, existing within one reality, and it's just our perception of reality that is limited. Also, RTD was just a bad bitch like that and wanted to get some Britney Spears in. Something I'm realizing about the RTD era is it uses way more licensed music than any other era. Now, uh, as we approach the end of the episode, I just want to talk about some little observations. This might be a thing I do. Just a little going through my notes and picking out a few observations that I had throughout the episode. I noticed that when the doctor fixes uh, Rose's phone so that she can phone her mum uh, back five billion years ago, he doesn't use a sonic screwdriver to fix the phone. He takes the battery out and puts a new phone battery in, which, first of all, I don't see how that would... <laughs> I don't see how that would work. Second of all, very convenient that he just happened to have that on him, and that it was just the right size and make of battery that needed to fit into Rose's phone. And third of all, I'm pretty sure he does this again a few times later on in the series, and just does it with his sonic screwdriver. Still, it's fun to see the Doctor solve a problem without the use of a sonic screwdriver for once. Oh, I didn't mention anything about the, the heat shield down, heat shield up uh, scene where Rose was almost going to get roasted alive in that room. Uh, I've really got nothing to say about it, but I just want to highlight it as a really fun scene. Palpable tension. Also, the romantic tension between the Doctor and Jade, the tree lady, is equally as palpable, and it's really sad that she died. It, I think it's the first, like, super tragic death in the show, and um, it, it's, it's, so, it's so bittersweet. Well, it's not even sweet, really. It's so bitter, because... You know, she knows she's the first person in the show to really know who he is and like break through to that part of him and tell her how sorry she is. Tell him how sorry she is, depending on the era. And then she literally lets herself get burned alive to help save the lives of those on the ship. She was a fucking boss. Oh, the spider bot killing the blue man by pressing a button on his keyboard to raise the heat shields, and then he <laughs> he couldn't stop it was hilarious. Like, I know it's probably implied that somewhere in the background the, the spider bots tinkered with, like, the space station so that they couldn't lower the heat shields after being raised in that particular room or something, but it was just so pathetic how he's watching the spider bot crawl about. He's like, oh, what are you? Oh no! And then it presses a single button on his keyboard. He's like, oh no! Oh, I'm going to die! <laughs> Like, buddy, maybe maybe you shouldn't have assigned that to a single button. Also, using a proper tactile keyboard five billion years in the future, damn, technology did not advance that far, huh? There's a really interesting scene as the Doctor re-enters a room and one of the aliens is talking to the face of Bo, and you can hear the aliens say, indubitably, this is the bad wolf scenario. And on the surface of it, that's just supposed to be the first mention of Bad Wolf, right? This recurring phrase which happens all throughout season one and then we figure out at the end of season one why it keeps recurring. And by the way, I, I fucking love that as an entire, like, story beat. I love fucking... Ah, so good. But when you think about it a little bit more, the face of Bo is later revealed to be none other than Captain Jack Harkness and he has foreknowledge of these events as they unfold and so the idea that he is discussing this with someone as the bad wolf scenario, it's almost like these two people are talking about like, oh yeah, we're at this moment in the Doctor and Rose's time stream. It's like, I, I would love to know if it was written with foreknowledge of these events happening, because it's like, you know, only two seasons later that Captain Jack is revealed to be the face of Bo. I would love to know if that's a, like a retcon or if that was planned from the very beginning, because that is... A lovely little easter egg for time travellers who have seen later eras of the series. Anyway, I think that's about all I've got to say about the end of a world. I think it's a bloody fantastic episode. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to leave a like if you liked the video and maybe subscribe for more because these will be coming out weekly. You think it'll last forever? People and cars and concrete. But it won't. One day it's all gone. Even the sky.